My name is Katharina Röckinger, I'm from DGWA. Uh, we're a German-based investment banking boutique and you might have heard our CEO Stefan Müller speak in the beginning. I'm very excited to be leading this panel here today on uniting mining with the restructuring of the automotive industry. Um, on the panel we have here, um, starting from left to right, we have Robert Bailey's portfolio manager of Inno Energy Fund. Europe's most active investor in energy in 2021. Then we have Dr. Wolfgang Bernhardt, senior partner, head of technology and innovation at Automotive Competence Center at Roland Berger, a season one-to-one -one speaker who's actually been giving a presentation earlier today already. And last but not least, Anthony Beckman, CEO of Kuniko Limited, an exploration company operating up in Scandinavia. EV sales around the globe are reaching new records. In 2021, EV sales accounted for 26% of new automotive sales globally, and we're actually on track to hit another record, an all-time high this year. Europe has become the second largest market for electric vehicles worldwide, as the continent is embracing the shift towards zero emission mobility. But there's been some supply shortages, some supply substraints and shortages and I'm just going to ask the panel to give me a one minute introduction about themselves so you know where they're coming from, and then we'll dive right in. I'll go first. Hi, my name is Anthony Beckman, uh, CEO of Kuniko Limited. Um, I've been in the mining industry for over 25 years now. I uh, started out in iron ore, um, have worked with mineral sands with Xaro. Uh, base metals with Pirelia in Australia, and I guess the last more than decade I've spent in Norway, uh, up in the far north, with a magnetite iron ore mine. Um, I did a bit of work in sulphate of potash in Australia, uh, where I got to know some of the KFW guys, which was interesting, um, and now working with Kuniko on battery metals exploration in Norway. Yeah, my name is Wolfgang Bernhardt, as I've been introduced very thanks a lot for that. Uh, I run beside other topics our global um, um, consulting activities around batteries. We started that about 12 years ago uh, with OEMs actually in, in, in automotive and um, at that time looking at the battery materials and how costs might develop because 12 years ago everybody was talking about 1000 euros per kilowatt hour. And the question was, where can we land and where are the limits and what's the cost of the materials? So we started with that and uh, during the last decade, I worked with a lot of OEMs on, on their strategies, but not only OEMs, but also other users of batteries. Then with most of the global um, cell manufacturers, all the, all the Korean ones, some Chinese, some, um, <clears throat> some Japanese, but, uh, but also the new players in Europe and uh, new solid players solid state players in the US uh, and with uh, cathode materials, PK manufacture, anode materials manufacture and mining, refining companies, and recycling companies. Um, specifically in the last three years, I would say the whole topic around supply chain and supply chain um, scarcity and how to, how to manage that became increasingly in, um, in the focus of, of the OEMs, but also the cell manufacturers, even, even earlier the cell manufacturers, I would say. And uh, we also work with them on, on strategies to secure critical materials to offtake agreements and direct project investments. Thanks, and thanks, Katharina, for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, my name is Robert Bayless. I currently work for the Inu Energy, uh, which is a public private. Uh, venture uh, funded um, today largely by the EU and uh, our main remit is energy transition so we're not well known in uh, the mining world we generally tend to look at things like solar hydrogen uh, batteries uh, and e-mobility um, but because of the um, pressure on the supply chain particularly for raw materials for the battery industry uh, we are actively involved in a number of projects in Europe to try and deliver raw materials to this supply chain. Uh, and we hope to be even more active in the future with plans for a new fund uh, that's gonna be concentrated on uh, investing in uh, mining projects uh, within Europe. Uh, prior to Inno Energy, I, I worked for John Mappe for the Battery Materials Division. So I sort of lived and breathed uh, the realities of, of being in the midstream of the market with uh, 
very dominant raw material suppliers at one end and, and very dominant OEMs at, at the other. Uh, and prior to that, I, I largely did consulting and uh, research on commodities for, for Roskill. Uh, so what, like Wolfgang had a lot of dealings with uh, both uh, suppliers and customers of, of raw materials. So uh, hopefully, I think uh, between the four of us, we uh, should be able to give you some interesting insights to this current topic today. Sure, thanks so much for the introduction. So maybe start with you, Wolfgang, since you just mentioned your consulting OEMs as well. How do they actually cope? 2022 has been quite a challenging year so far. How do OEMs cope with supply chain risk and savings um, conductor shortages, for example? I, I think they do all. In fact, they do all, all engaging programs and all engaged in, in activities to, to secure supply. Uh, that has been different. I remember discussions two years ago, two and a half years ago, where they said that uh, the set suppliers will be with that. Uh, and there's no issue, the, the, the market will, will, will work it out. But I think um, they, they did forget, uh, as, as with semiconductors uh, 10 years ago, we had also semiconductor crisis, everybody forgot that because nobody was in, in charge anymore two years ago. But um, uh, as uh, since that caused big troubles, they, I think they, they understood they had, that they had to do something. And uh, we do see a lot of activities. Um, we have seen the, the, from, from, uh, the, from, from Tesla, we have seen probably the first activities quite some years ago, which give them, should give them a significant advantage in terms of cost, because at that time they were, um, were most likely able to, to strike some leads at fixed prices, which is not, not possible anymore, or nearly not possible anymore. And we do see a lot of activities from from the Chinese or from the cell manufacturers. I would say specifically CATL, that uh, has bought everything, you know, is buying everything that they can get their grips on. But um, meanwhile, I, I think a lot of a lot of OEMs have realized that they, they a lot of a lot of activities are being are public. Um, but at the same time, decisions are also slow at OEMs. And it takes quite some time to, to engage with that. That's number one. Number two is specifically if you if you do investments, you need to have the the the, the know-how, the capability, the competences uh, that most of them do not have yet. I would say, uh, if, if again, if you look at Tesla, they have a significant team that that is able to understand whether whether a junior mining project can be successful or not, and how the, and to to basically. Um, understand the risk associate, associated. I think that is something the OEMs are trying to build up, at least some of them, the larger ones. How about the European OEMs? Maybe Robert, you can add something to that. Yeah, I, I agree with Wolfgang. It's, um, it's been a, a speedy learning curve, for sure. I mean, I think uh, you're right. Tesla uh, lived and breathed some of these issues maybe five or six years ago with um, ventures or offtakes with uh, junior projects particularly some in, in the US or in North America that ultimately turned out to not go anywhere and still haven't gone anywhere. Um, and then their focus quickly shifted to more reliable suppliers that they could count on to, to deliver their raw materials. But it, it is, and I think one of the, the biggest um, hurdles to this automotive transition, the energy transition, is simply uh, knowledge. And, and there isn't a lot of it. And you know everybody is crying out for, for talent. Um, and unfortunately, I guess you'd probably say, you know, beyond simply making cells and making electric vehicles, understanding of the raw materials industry is equally uh, poorly uh, resourced, you know, even in Europe. I mean, I think the case in the UK, uh, I think we've only got sort of two institutions that still teach mining, and I think one of those is closing down now. So, uh, yeah, there, there, just, there just isn't the, the understanding there to, to sort of realise, you know, what's at stake. And, and I think the, the, the reality is, Sort of come quick and it's come hard um, and i think now we're seeing action uh, from the oems in, in europe um, getting more involved directly with suppliers and i think it has probably from the semiconductor experience sort of catalyzed this idea about supply security over price you know before it was price 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 and the market will you know naturally find its own way uh, now it's you know price is all very well and good if you can actually get the materials but if you can't then like semiconductors, you, you end up with a you know a, a reduced output, and, and that's not good for your business. Yeah, I think another uh, to add one point, another catalyst was the uh, 
what was the Dutch days of Tesla a, a, a few years ago or so, when they when they also maybe overstated, but but then at least they made the point that uh, covering the whole supply chain from a competence perspective and from being involved also allows to uh, to, to basically reduce costs by by really understanding, for example, the purity of the uh, of the raw materials, how, how everything fits together, and optimizing between metallurgy, chemistry, and, and cell design. And that has only slowly tri tripled in or, or yeah, being recognized by, by, by others, but I think that's recognized as well, and that's another trigger. Thanks, guys. I agree with your comments. I think for me, it's, you know, this transition, uh, there's a lack of resources. There, there's a few things to unpack here uh, from my point of view. It's, uh, it's about capacity. Um, is there enough uh, mineral resources? Have we got enough being uh, invested? Um, as well as uh, collaboration, and uh, following that, um, uh, really accountability uh, for how we develop projects. So I think these four things, uh, for me, are, are part of what we need to address uh, in, in the transition. Sure, how about in Europe? What sort of projects are there that are set to make a big difference in the next coming years? Sorry, what projects? What projects will solve the European critical raw material supply issue? Yeah, I, I guess we can all look to the EU critical minerals list. You know, we've got, there's minerals in short supply, cobalt, uh, nickel, um, lithium, but you know, I, I think it's, it goes beyond uh, that, uh, it's really minerals focused on uh, either energy, a uh, green energy transition uh, or modern technology, uh, including the electric vehicle. Uh, they're the projects that are the best place to, to move forward. So benchmark minerals projects that we need another 384 mines until 2035 to meet the what we need in terms of battery capacity. Do you see that European projects will make some sort of impact on this as well in the next 10, 15 years? Yes. I work for a Norwegian-based yeah. explorer, so <laughs> exactly. I, I, I think there can be a contribution. I mean, I think it's clear that, um, you know, Europe isn't particularly very heavily resource blessed in, in the materials that we need for this uh, automotive or wider energy transition. So fundamentally, you know, we have a, a geology problem, um, and you know, I was talking to oh, uh, Anthony earlier. Well, yeah, the, the resource is in the ground; it's just poorly explored and, and poorly understood. And, and I think, um, you know, we were saying that uh, one of the challenges has been is that some of the projects that were now, um, you know, relatively sort of mature in, in their market position, but have, haven't really moved on very far in the last sort of five or so years. Is because of some of the issues that they've run into in Europe, particularly around permitting, uh, you know, NIMBYism in terms of, um, you know, the lot of want of mining uh, within the EU, um, but also things like financing as well. We've been through several uh, sort of cycles within various commodities, and, and as a result, uh, you know, I think Europe has sort of fallen behind um, in, in sort of generating new resources for, for what's required, and I think some catch up can be done. Um, but it, you're looking at a longer time frame now to realize that production. So there's a few gems, uh, there's a few projects out there that, that I think can deliver in, in sort of the medium term, um, but it, it's not going to be anywhere near enough. And I think that's why now you're seeing um, more partnerships on a, a sort of political level that'll sort of narrowly, sort of gradually uh, sort of deepen towards a sort of more corporate level uh, between EU or states and other countries around the world. Um, but also um, OEMs starting to look further afield uh, into jurisdictions that, that maybe would be sort of previously observed as problematic um, simply to fill that gap. Um, but I would hope that, you know, with a bit of future sort of thinking that more um, domestic uh, resources could, could play a part in, in the longer term. Um, but, but that requires action today uh, if you're going to see it in the next 10 or 15 years for sure. And I think there's, and it has been mentioned, I think there's a, there's a big a big task in, in communicating and getting the, the public opinion on board. 
odds by, by the respective actions. So if, I look, if we look at the, uh, the Rio Tinto project in, 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 in Serbia or at the Linga do Barroso project in, in North Portugal, so they all face some, uh, some issues with, with public opinion and, 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 and people living there. So, so it, has, it has to be sustainable. It has to be um, properly communicated. A lot of things have, have to be done in advance, which most likely will also not uh, not speed up the process. So in, in, in that time frame, it's probably very hard to, to, really, to really supply. I, I can't see it how, how, how the demands from Europe could be supplied by, by European mining projects. I don't see that at all. It, at least not in that time frame. Longer term, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a geologist. Uh, I'm not a geologist, but uh, the Nordics are mineral rich, um, and you know I think Finland and Sweden have been sort of leading the way in terms of mining. I don't think Europe can you know solve its own problem, but the Nordics can certainly yeah. contribute. That's for sure. Um, you know, I'm based in Norway, and it's you know I think the sentiment of not in my backyard is across Europe. Um, but what I'm trying to do is bring projects, you know, to bear, including cobalt projects, um, that really put the tough question to the public of where does the accountability sit? And I think we spoke about this at lunch, but I, I, I think there's a real question here of accountability um, on the DRC uh, and Indonesia for nickel. You know, to, to meet the energy transition, we need cobalt, we need nickel, um, is, uh, are these two places just left to China? Does Europe just give up? Um, I don't think any of us got the answer, but I, th I think we need to at least uh, put the question in, out in the open. Maybe if we stay at cell chemistry, do you see any competing technologies eroding away demand, for example, for, for lithium? You know, Wolfgang, you mentioned it earlier today, not anytime soon, but how about sodium ion? Maybe you can give us a bit more of a background for this audience here now. Yes, I mean, sodium ion uh, got in the eyes of the public, I would say, with the announcement of CATL to, to bring that to the market uh, very soon and also to the automotive market. Um, I think that's something for, as I mentioned already today, that's something for stationary energy storage because of the, uh, of the energy density that you get. Maybe for some two wheelers and, and low speed vehicles, but not for the normal cars, at least not for the time being. And, and uh, there, there's quite some work to do, and I would not see that as, as any substitution risk for, for a significant share of the, um, of the total demand for, for lithium ion batteries. Uh, I would say that might be a, a, f a few gigawatt hours in 2030, you know, maybe. 20, 50, 20, but not more. And, and, and that in the overall context uh, does make a difference. I think uh, an important technical point to make on sodium ion batteries is that, a bit like lithium ion batteries, there's a number of individual uh, chemistries within that. And funnily enough, um, yeah, the, the, the challenge is if you find a sodium ion battery with the most sort of performance matching to get, say, an LFP, it's the one that uses also. Uh, transition metals in, in the cathode. Uh, the, the technology that uses um, sort of uh, just uh, an iron based cathode or, or even a, 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 you know, an organic cathode um, can fulfill some requirement for like energy storage, but it's never going to be good enough for vehicles, in particular, it lacks the, the power. Um, so, yes, sodium, I think, will solve part of the lithium problem. Um, I don't think it's, it's going to come along and solve any of the, the other transition metal problems. Um, so I think, you know, when, when you think about sodium ion, it's how much of the lithium demands can you can you drop? Um, because, you know, 380 mines of which, you know, a fair amount of those will, will need to be lithium. Um, and, and that's a, a, a big ask when, you know, there's a substitute to nickel-based chemistry in, in lithium ion batteries, but there's not a substitute to lithium in lithium ion batteries. So I think sodium ion, has a role to play. I actually heard a company the other day talking about potassium ion batteries um, again. So yeah, what I think it's the key thing. So look, um, you know, what the famous saying that the cure for high prices is high prices, but also is that going to be um, a resource driven cure or is it going to be a demand 
uh, technology-driven cure. Um, but you know, we're, we're all here for uh, natural resources, and yeah, we're, we're lucky. Sodium iron still needs <laughs> natural resources, so maybe the focus will will shift, and we'll see some um, projects coming through that, that can supply the raw materials for that industry in the future instead. Hopefully, with um, new technologies as well, the ultimate uh, benefit is the consumer with lower cost price matrix. Um, if they, if you can take the uh, or ease the demand for, for lithium ion uh, batteries, the hopefully uh, that flows through the consumer. Indo Energy has invested almost 300 million in projects that have raised 2.5 billion to support the decarbonisation of Europe by 2050 ranking it the most active investor in energy in 2021. A little compliment right there. <laughs> but are sustainable thematic funds comfortable investing in upstream mining projects? What are some of the ESG considerations? Yeah, I, I guess on the bigger picture perspective, yes, because I think the ultimate goal is one that is um, you know, clearly decarbonization. So I think it's a sort of natural fit that's uh, to deliver those uh, technologies for the energy transition, you need uh, raw materials instead of um, you know, hydrocarbon-based uh, fuel. Um, and that's where the ultimate sort of trade-off comes, I think, is, is the supply chain for one and the outcome better than, than what we currently sort of see today. Um, and I think, you know, in general, um, that whole value chain for all of those raw materials, for all of those energy transition technologies, has the opportunity to be improved. And I think that's you know, where a lot of the attention is, is coming now is an acceptance that you know, nickel mining in Indonesia is very energy intensive and um, high CO2, um, but a lot of other projects around the world or technologies that could be applied, say in Indonesia, would do a great deal of uh, benefits to, to reducing that. And, and I think that you know, when, when um, investors look at that opportunity, that's your sort of sustainability goal. Yes, uh, there is the longer term sort of zero, net zero, carbon neutral approach, um, but it's going to take time. And um, I think that, uh, you know, as long as you can show that you're, you're sort of moving in that direction, it's, it's accepted. Um, even though today we know there are uh, hot spots and uh, problems to, to fix. Look at zero carbon, so you go. Yeah, so uh, Kuniko's uh, branded uh, zero carbon battery metals. Uh, so our history is uh, the company was uh, spun out of Vulcan uh, Energy Resources with the lithium brine project here in Germany. Um, so that presents a, a massive challenge, an interesting challenge. Um, and I think it's the catalyst for change. Um, we're not just focused on drill holes, greater drill holes, but at the same time, in parallel, we're trying to come up with uh, potential answers to the problems we know we'll face uh, in the future. So we can't promise zero carbon, but we are working actively uh, along our own value chain uh, to try and solve the problem. And we can't do it alone. Um, so, you know, it, it's from, uh, I guess the, the mining um, equipment OEMs that we're dealing with uh, through to, uh, I guess, people within our own circular economy. Uh, one of the big issues we faced in, in Norway and probably across the Nordics in Europe is if you have a successful mine, what do you do with mining waste? You know, we're talking uh, about uh, products like nickel, maybe it's 2%, maybe it's 1%. So 99% waste, uh, that's the most important uh, question we've got to answer. Yeah, I, I think the audience, even if they are not necessarily paying more for, for products that, that have a lower carbon footprint, for example, uh, they are clearly demanding that. And uh, I mentioned in, in the morning in my, my presentation, there is not certainly the fit with the cell manufacturers. And interestingly enough, um, the, the Korean ones, they, had, they, they, they told us ESG is only medium to low important. That, that was what, what they said. But they were clearly aware that this gets much more important. So then they were the only ones, the others either ranked it high or lower. You know? uh, so, and and that, was, that was clearly, uh, is clearly triggered by the OEMs because they even worked with one of them on, on respective topics, how to 
strategies that are helpful. So the the um, it, it's it's understood and it will and it will go down the value or upstream in the value chain if those requirements are met. Specifically, if, if there are if there are ways to choose at the moment, I guess at the moment it's maybe a little bit tough, but if there are ways to choose, it becomes more important. We definitely need to get the auto OEMs up the value chain. Um, from our opening discussion, uh, how do we increase capacity? Um, how do we address innovation? How do we solve the problems along the supply chain? Um, we need to be collaborating together, and that's uh, a partnership. I think it's you know a, a different model, <laughs> um, not one that I'm used to. My background is more you know, uh, selling to a large. Uh, iron ore steel mills in, in Europe and it's quite confrontational and so are we aligned? Um, we're trying to you know solve the same problems, the auto OEMs have their own uh, carbon targets so how do they meet those? They've got to come down the value chain to where I am um, and invest. We already see that around the globe, not so much in Europe just yet, but maybe to share a few experiences, what, what you're seeing as, as we were talking before. It's picking up, it's getting more and more, the awareness is there that you actually need to go upstream to secure your raw materials in the future if you want to stay competitive, if you don't want your showrooms to be empty in a couple of years, you need to get this stuff sorted now. Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of big, big drivers to this. Um, number one, I think I think the OEMs and, and the cell manufacturers um, sort of well understand, you know, that the, it's now moving towards a partnership approach versus sort of just a pure supplier sort of customer approach. Because it, it, in the end, um, naturally, that that always sort of boils down to you know product and price. Um, and a partnership can bring a lot more benefits to, to that relationship. Um, and, and I would say my experience of having dealt with uh, raw material suppliers as well is that they're, they're equally keen to, to see that, albeit not to want to lose the value of the, the product that they're uh, producing. The, the other side of it is that, um, that there is clearly, as we were talking about from the sustainability perspective, there's a lot to be done on uh, changing the current sort of value chain structure to, to one that's more fit for purpose. Um, and that means you know, more co-location, uh, more deeper thinking about how to transform, how to extract and transform materials uh, into usable form in the least amount of steps, with the least amount of energy, the least amount of reagents, in the quickest amount of time. And um, that naturally works best you know, when there is a, a, a partnership versus a, you know, a, a contract. Um, and I think, you know, again, Tesla, uh, it's probably the, the, the company that's been the most public in terms of its you know, bold ambition for what that could look like. You know, li lithium uh, from, uh, what was it Elon said, it's sort of um, you know, just apply a bit of salt and, and you can get from ore to, to, to feedstock. Well, yeah, good thinking might not be that simple, but at least it shows that there is um, an approach to it. And, and in actual fact, um, you would arguably say that, that you know, it, it's maybe the downstream that's pushing that more than the existing uh, mining companies uh, in terms of what I, I see today. Um, there hasn't been, you know, huge amounts of technical breakthrough for a lot of these raw material processes for, for, for a long time. And, and arguably, um, you know, something like geothermal lithium with direct lithium extraction could be, you know, one of the big game changers for the industry. Um, but, you know, we're not seeing anything particularly unique for, for nickel or for cobalt, or for manganese, uh, you know, they're still generally uh, the established routes that have just been tweaked, no, nothing earth shatteringly new that's going to solve all our um, speed, time, uh, price, cost, ESG uh, issues. I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, if we're ever going to get a, some, a set of fundamentals that will innovate, isn't now the time? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. I think, and I think you, you'll probably see that, that it'll come. Uh, you know, that naturally the market is looking for a solution. Uh, we talked about you know different technologies, different raw materials that will take, but also actually you know the traditional materials, but with new process applied, could could also be a game changer. Yeah, we we would also expect from a long term perspective uh, that the market that is pretty much here today from, from mining to refining to, to, to 
can you can to some manufacturing and then finally do to packs and OEMs with five, six more tiers that that is going to to restructure significantly. And we do see that already with activities from companies like Orion Cobalt that, that go from mining to become an even capital material production, completely vertically integrated. We see it with CATL going the other direction, in the other direction, integrating vertically. Uh, POSCO, as an example, they are doing everything basically for the cell and then uh, from mining in, in uh, the, the lithium, nickel, um, graphite, everything, then up to up to the, the electrodes and then working very closely together, co-investing with LG, for example, in, in and again, Hawaii Cobalt in, in Indonesia to, to cover the whole supply chain. And that type of, uh, and the same is, is true for, for CATL. And that gives them also a cost advantage. So I would say uh, we do see a lot of these direct investments also to secure not only supply but also price. Now that's a risk, obviously, because it can go in both directions. But um, the, these investments of uh, in Indonesia of, of, of CATL and, and uh, CATL and PROM basically is $6 billion. And why Cobalt, uh, LG, and, and POSCO is $8 billion. And it covers everything. Yeah, and it gives them the opportunity also with, with the they need to do 60 to 70 percent of the value add in the country, but the rest they can basically feed in their other supply chains, and at the end of the day charge whatever they whatever they want, yeah, because they they will they they will most likely stick to their prices that have raw material price fell clauses, so that gives them an, 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 a significant advantage, um, but also obviously needs a lot of money. But, uh, but it's also the, uh, the, the simple thought that if you have roughly, as a rule of thumb, 10% margin in cell, 10 in PCAM, 10 in CAM, 10 in CAM, and then elsewhere between 20 and 50 on the mining refining side, this means 50% across the value chain. And uh, we have seen from other sectors of automotive that the vertical integration is typically very high at, in, in a major stage of the market because the margins get under pressure and, and every, every step is squeezed out. So since we only have a few minutes left, we're in the heart of Germany here. The bread and butter business is the automotive industry. What sort of, we have also a few financiers in, in the room so and investors. What sort of recommendations would you give so that Europe stays I, would, I wouldn't say stays ahead of the curve because we're really not, but play catch up. What do we need to do in Europe to get to where we want to be, to reach our decarbonization goals? Wow, that's a big question to answer, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, many, many facts to that. I, I, I think you know, there needs to be a good hard look at, at, at going for things that are going to really make a difference and, and you know, being clear on what those are. And, and I think, you know, it's difficult for the sort of mining industry to have this sort of scattergun approach, you know, from a sort of early stage all the way through to, you know, one or two big projects at, at the end. Um, but, but is it the time, particularly for this value chain, to look and say, you know, what's out there? What do we really need? Let's go at it and make sure it happens rather than spread the resource around too, too thinly. In the short term, while well, have that mind, okay, for the long term, you know, projects like Kuniko in Nor Norway, you know, that, that's going to come in the future. You know, we've got to keep those projects going at the same time as, you know, fixing the short-term problem. I would, I would say probably in addition, uh, the, there's a huge amount of capital needed. Yeah, and uh, the, I, I would say for, for you alone, 70, 80 billion dollars for the, for the upstream part, not talking about the capital and the production. And that money, uh, that money competes, or that, that money demand competes with other demands. So, so there might be, it, it might be necessary to to guarantees, make some guarantees from from the state on perspective, from the state perspective, etc. Because we cannot match the three hundred uh, something billion dollars of the IRA. That's impossible in, in Europe. So it, there have to be other other measures that, that, that work out and 
that might be something. Um, also, I think it's uh, it's necessary to um, to make sure that everything that's being used here complies with certain standards when it comes to to, to emissions, etc. In order to to get to kind of level playing field, I know that seems pretty different depending on to whom you talk, but that might be another another route to go. But the, the supporting the financing is probably one of the biggest issue issue. Yeah, guarantees are helpful, but they they generally come after you've secured the initial uh, financing. Um, so. Yeah, in my 50 seconds left, um, there's still plenty of opportunities for European OEMs to move down the value chain and increase capacity, not only in mining resources or reserves, um, but it's also the uh, processing uh, capacity that you spoke about. And you know, we, we've got to get beyond, right? Right to the recycling end. Um, so there's plenty of opportunities with a 50 billion euro a year industry here. Um, we're uh, primed to, to innovate now, um, but we need to see that investment flow down the value chain. Wonderful. That was actually right on time. Thank you very much.